Unless you've been living under a rock for the past several, several months, you'll know that the world is closer than it's ever been to nuclear war and the United States is directly involved. But did you know that George Washington, General George Washington, the founding father of the United States of America, of all people, received a vision, a prophetic word about just this exact same thing. We're going to talk about this today because it's called the third peril that's now upon us. It's a prophetic warning, a very dire warning, but there's also a blessing at the end of it. And there's definitely a blessing in understanding the things that were shown to George Washington all the way back in 1777 in the Valley Forge. So let's get into this and let's take a look at what did he receive in a prophetic vision that just so happens to be exactly what we're seeing right now taking place in the world. Let's get into it. Shalom. It is late right now. Woo, it is a late night over here in the United States. But we have a special guest from overseas joining us today. You may have checked out a video that we did together already. His name is Steven Spikerman. Before I bring Steven Spikerman on, uh why so late because uh we're in different time zones and this is how it works for us guys okay <laughs> it's just the best way to coordinate we're talking about a, a vision that george washington had a prophetic vision and it is it is really profound guys this is the stuff you don't learn about in history class these are the things that they, the system doesn't want you to know about your origins about your identity about the identity of of the founders of this country and the things that led up to the creation of the United States. It's truly amazing information. Now, before, again, I bring on our guest, I just want you to think back. Think back to the year 2020, okay? Think back to 2020. What, what was life like? What were you up to? Oh, let's, let's say January of 2020, uh, maybe February of 2020. Not March, not yet. We're not going to be there yet. But I want you to go in a time machine with me. Just go back in time. What were you up to? Who would you, who were your friends? Who were you hanging out with? What were you doing? Uh, what what were you what were you pursuing back then? I I know what I was pursuing. I was pursuing uh, uh the wrong things. Uh, my focus and my energy was was on the wrong things. But then March came around, right? March 2020 came around, and a lot of us woke up very very quickly during March 2020, right? We started hearing about something called the Great Reset on the news. We started hearing about all these different things happening in 2020. And all of a sudden, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, in my house, our perspective started shifting back to the most high. We started getting more serious with God because we had been slacking a little bit. And my guest today, he also did something in 2020 he put together a book. We're going to talk about this book quite a bit today. It's called George Washington's Prophetic Vision and its relevance to 2020's America. You see, our brother joining us today, he put together a book during that time period. See, he's already been in this fight for a lot longer. He was, he's been in this. He's been working for the kingdom and doing business for God for a lot longer, right? Some of us just barely snapped out of our out of our stupor, out of being asleep. But see, he wrote this and it was a timely, it's a very timely message. This, what we're talking about today could be very well one of the last times that we have the opportunity to even warn America, Americans, the world about, about what is going to happen. And we get some extreme clarity in the pages of this book. So I can't recommend it enough. I absolutely love it and it's very eye-opening and like i said at the intro to this there's a blessing in understanding these things so with that said our brother stephen has been diligent to publish this book in the year 2020 
He did it in six weeks. Is that right, Stephen? You did the book in yeah. six weeks. Yeah. Tell us about that. It was a heavy message on your heart. How did it all come about? Well, really, it started uh, about 15 years earlier uh, when I uh, um, accidentally uh, came across uh, this whole thing about Washington uh, having these visions. And um, so I, 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 uh, when I heard about it, I, I, I got a whole number of them uh, on the Internet. Uh, and the, the, the vision that the, the three visions Washington had have been preserved in, in, in the Library of Congress and, and you can access them, you know, uh, via the Internet. And uh, so I, I, I had a, a, a load of them printed and different versions, but I got the sort of classic one and I was I was I was so impressed by it and, and so convicted by it. And what did it for me is that I felt that what Washington was seeing and, and prophes being, being prophesied to him by this angel which visited him in his command tent at, at a crisis point in his career. And um, what, what really struck me that there was the vision was in line with the scriptures of the Bible, the prophecies of the Bible. That's what hit me. And that's really got me. And, and so I actually started comparing every aspect of the vision with the prophecies of the Bible. And I was snap, 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 all the way down the line. There was, there was complete synergy between the two. And so I thought, wow, 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 wow. Uh, I, I attended a conference in America and I, I mentioned this, uh, uh, that was about 10 years ago or thereabouts, and there was great resonance in the audience uh, about it. And, um, and uh, I, I resolved at the end of that, that one day I would have to give this message to America uh, because it was, a, it was almost like the final message to America. And I knew that one day I would have to give this message. So I put the thing aside and 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 decided that in, in the future, I will be able to give this message. So what happened then? 10 years passed and, and we got to 2020. And I suddenly was filled with incredible urgency to, to pick this message up and to pick the visions up uh, which I had printed out. So I got the file out and then I started writing this book. And and uh, the result is here before us. Now, it, it took six weeks, but I'm putting myself under enormous pressure doing it uh, because I had such a, a sense of urgency about the whole thing. Uh, right. the, the whole world was suffering from COVID at the time. And... Um, so we were we were really pushed, and um, that's why I, I I actually wrote the book. I had the book uh, f formatted and edited, and then published all inside of six weeks. Something I've never done. I, I normally take a whole year to produce a book, <laughs> but this time it, there was such urgency about it, and then having done it and having got it off, signed off, published self-published by Amazon, I then had a major heart attack on my birthday. It was oh. my 80th birthday, believe it or not. Oh, <laughs> man, that's horrible. And, and so the fact that I had this major heart attack, uh, it was a, a widow-maker heart attack, I was told by the surgeon. <laughs> oh. And, and uh, I, it put me out of action for about a year, you know, before I could summon my... my, my uh, my life back together again and uh, so um, it was I missed this first year of publication so there was no promotion whatsoever it was just put on Amazon and that was it finish I, I, I got a few people to write a few reviews and that was it so you know this is so sad 
uh, I've written other things since and published other things since. But, you know, this one really went by the wayside because I was taken out, out of the picture. Uh, and so I'm so grateful to my good friend Abraham Ochida, my good friend, um, that he is giving me the opportunity to promote this book. And we are really uh, three years further on now, and we are virtually at the closing age of you know, the United States of America. Because the mm -hmm. United States of America is doomed, doomed to destruction, and that destruction is going to take place very soon now. And, well, we're gonna uh, let's let's get into that in a moment, Stephen. I just want to say yeah. thank you guys for joining. We do have a few people here live with us. Most of you guys are from overseas. Thank you, Yeshua, bless you and keep you and be with you. Um, smash the like, share, uh, drop a comment when we're all done here because I know the comments are disabled while we're doing the live stream itself. But drop a comment, spread the word. This is a diamond in the rough. Again, just to repeat what Stephen was saying. Uh, this is a gem. This is a hard to find information in here. Uh, you'll find it scattered on the internet, but he has it so well cited, resourced, sourced out. It's so well written uh, from front to back and documented for us. This is the real deal. The history is there. The evidence is there. The witnesses, the narrators, everything is there. And it's just a well-written account of what happened in George Washington's life. I can't wait to talk about it more. Uh, and yes, there's doom in it. And I, you know, the way the Bible's written, there's doom, doom, doom. Like we read Joel chapter two. We're going to look at Joel chapter two today. Doom, doom, doom. But there's always a blessing on the other side of the doom. So <clears throat> I can't yeah. wait to talk about that as well. Yeah. Um, well, Stephen, are you ready to get into it? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. I like to start with the soldier's psalm. The soldier's psalm is reputedly Psalm 91. And I'm, I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but I'm going to read you some verses from uh, Psalm 91, and starting at verses 1 to 2, and then going on to verse 5 and 7, and then ending up with verse 11. It's, it's quite a, a beautiful, beautiful word for those who are at the front, at the front line of the battle. Uh, he who dwells in the most secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. A thousand may fall at your side, and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you, for he has given his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Well, by all accounts, young Washington seems to have been the recipients of God's supernatural protection, right. so much so that he became known as the soldier who could not die. Now, that's quite an accolade, isn't it? <laughs> but this actually proved to be the fact, because in the French and Indian War of 1753 to 1763, the Americans and their English and Indian allies fought the French and their Indian allies. In 1755, 23-year-old Colonel Washington brought a 100 Virginian buckskins to join forces with veteran General Edward Braddock and his 1300 British troops on an expedition to oust the French from western Pennsylvania. Their combined force reached a point seven miles from the French fort and while following a path through a wooded ravine they marched directly into a waiting ambush. The enemy opened fire on them from both sides. Braddock's soldiers were veterans from European wars and th that were traditionally fought on open ground rather than in woods such as in Pennsylvania. When the British came under fire, they lined up shoulder to shoulder along the bottom of the ravine and not surprisingly were slaughtered. Over the next two hours, 714 were shot down, 
with only 30 of the French and Indians being shot, nearly all of those by Washington's buckskins, who were accustomed to woodland warfare and had sought cover when the attack began. Of the 86 British and American officers in the battle, 62 were either killed or wounded. George Washington was the only mounted officer not shot off down off his horse, though he had been particularly vulnerable, having courageously ridden back and forth along the front lines, delivering General Braddock's orders among the troops. When General Braddock was mortally wounded, Washington took command and gathered the panicked troops and retreated to Virginia. Along the way, Braddock died, and Washington, whose request for military chaplains for the Virginia troops had been regularly refused by the governor of Virginia, took on himself the role of a military chaplain, personally conducting the funeral service, reading scriptures, and offering prayers. Washington and his bedraggled men finally reached Fort Cumberland in Western Maryland on July 17, 1755. Word had spread across the colonies that all the troops had been killed, so Washington promptly wrote his family, assuring them that he was still alive, but only as a result of what he describes as the miraculous care of Providence. He also told his, his, his brother, I have heard since my arrival at this place, Fort Cumberland, a circumstantial account of my death and dying speech. I take this opportunity of contradicting of contradicting the first and of assuring you that I have not yet composed the latter. But by the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability and expectation, for I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me and yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a statement, isn't it? Yeah. So, wow. so if in case you guys are wondering, that's uh, and I'm, I appreciate you reading that because that's actually the first couple of slides I have. This is from like the introduction of the book. So you guys just got the audio book version of this uh, magnificent work here by by Stephen. Um, uh, I, I just want to throw this on screen because what we just read is the fact that George Washington. Uh, I already saw it in the chat, by the way, like someone's like, oh, he's a satanic Mason. Well, we'll address that. We'll address that. You know? Yeah, that's definitely the popular opinion these days. But let's take a look at let's take a look at his life a little bit and we'll, we'll see. We'll put that to the test. Right. The, yeah. the basically the conspiracy crowd. But he was preserved. He should have died many times and he receives a vision. And the words are this, guys, and the words are very relevant for us today. Son of the Republic, look and learn. Even if you're outside of the United States, look and learn. Even if you're not a son of the Republic, like I am, I was born and raised here. Uh, Stephen, he's a he's a red coat, right? He's British. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you live you live in Wales. <laughs> you live in Wales, but you're originally from Netherlands, right? Um, <laughs> I'm wearing a blue coat at the moment. <laughs> a blue coat. <laughs> well, you're kind of a red coat these days, but um, but even if you're not a son of the Republic, guys, okay? If you're not American look and learn. This is the call to action for today. And again, we're addressing this question. Who is George Washington? Yeah, what yeah. what Stephen just, just showed you is that he sh George Washington should have died a few times. Yeah, I'd like to actually follow on with the uh, the, the next uh, item that, that occurred in his life that, that really confirms the whole thing. Uh, there was a, a very famous preacher man uh, uh, who, who was called Samuel Davis, uh, the Reverend Samuel Davis, considered the greatest pulpit preacher in America and a notable leader in the national revival known as the Great Awakening of 1730 to 1770. He suggested that the manner in which God had directly intervened to preserve the young and largely unknown Washington certainly seemed to indicate that providence has hitherto preserved him for some important service to his country. Uh, additional information, confirmation of just how miraculous Washington's preservation 
ha had been came later in 1770, uh, Washington had returned uh, to the same Pennsylvania woods in which he had earlier fought, but this time on a peaceful surveying mission. While preparing for the campaign against the French, the British government had General Braddock uh, 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 offer Virginia colonials parcels of land in Ohio in exchange for their combat service. Braddock's disastrous encounter with the French forces on the Monongahela River site also brought about the deaths of many men of the Virginia Regiment. Washington was intent on seeing to it that the British kept their promises to these veterans and the families of fallen soldiers. So in 1770, Washington was permitted to notify all claimants uh, that, that, su that surveying of approved lands would proceed and once completed, the lands would be parceled out to veterans or their heirs. The scouting party considered of Colonel Washington, fellow veteran and surveyor William Crawford, and <clears throat> excuse me, Joseph Nicholson, and Dr. James Craig, a lifelong friend of Washington's and who attended him in his final hours. They set out from Fort Pitt by, by canoe uh, and to explore the possible bounty sites and the soldiers' land. While at the camp in the woods of the Ohio Kanawha rivers, <coughs> the group was approached by a party of non-threatening looking natives who apparently had been tracking the progress of these white colonials because their chief had long wanted to meet Washington. The chief indicated that he wanted to talk with Washington, so a council fire was soon kindled and with Joseph Nicholson serving as interpreter, the chief revealed that it was he who commanded the ambush on the British and Virginian soldiers on the banks of the Monongahela River. The, and the Grand Sachem continued, I am the chief and ruler of many tribes. My influence extends in the waters of the Great Lakes and to the far blue mountains. I have traveled a long and weary path that I might see the young warrior of the great battle. It was on the day when the white man's blood mixed with the streams of our forests that I first beheld this chief, Washington. I called to my young men and said, Mark, you tall and daring warrior. He is not of the red coat tribe. He hath an Indian's wisdom and his warriors fight as we do, himself alone exposed. Quick, let your aim be certain, and he dies. Our, our rifles were leveled, rifles which but for you did not, did not miss. It was all in vain. A power mightier than we shielded him from harm. He did not die in battle. I am old and I shall be gathering to the great council fire by my fathers in the land of the shades. But ere I go, there is something bids me to speak in the voice of prophecy. Listen, the great spirit protects that man and guides his destinies. He will become the chief of many nations and a people yet unborn will hail him as the founder of a mighty empire. I am come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven and who can never die in battle. Can, can I chime in here, Stephen? What, yeah. When I first read this in your book, I was so, my jaw hit the floor really because you have this Native American chief who is prophesying over George Washington and I, I just never heard of such a thing ever, first of all. But the, what he says, and you, 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 you say that also here that it's recorded in many history books, is that he would be the founder of a mighty empire. And see, yeah. that's, that's really what I wanted to show next on screen is, um, 
At 23 years old, that's what we just talked about. Washington survives an ambush during the French and Indian War on the banks of the, oh man, this is a tough one, Monongahela. Sorry for all those who are in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. I don't know how to pronounce that really well. (laughs) Monongahela. Monongahela. I know you had a, it was a mouthful, right, Stephen? Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) right. His horse has died twice. He's shot. He's got bullet holes, four bullet holes in his coat. He still lived. And so what I want to bring up, guys, is... Yeah. Okay. I know there's some conspiracy stuff about Washington. Let's just set that to the side for a moment. Look at what Daniel says. The prophet Daniel, Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his. He changes and he changes the times and seasons. He removes Kings and raises up Kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. But it says that, he raises up kings. This is from Daniel yeah. chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. So whether you maybe, you know, you've read some things that you, you don't like George Washington, or maybe there's some things that you're like, I don't know, dude. I think he's just a Freemason guy. Just understand, though, that he was raised up. And what we're reading and what we're understanding here is that how he was raised up, the nature by which he was raised up. Any thoughts on that, Stephen? Yeah, I, I also, uh, uh, what is also relevant is that masonry in the days of Washington was was simply uh, something that had sprung from a, uh, a guild, uh, a workers' guild. And in this case, the workers' guild was builders or architects, right? And so um, these, these uh, uh, the, 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 the masons in those days were people who were interested in building and in architecture. And it, it, there was no uh, demonic uh, uh, situation there at all. That came in much later. Uh, it came in about uh, uh, almost half a century later when people like Weishaupt, uh, some, some German guy, and some other guy completely polluted the whole Masonic guild that existed. It was a guild of master builders. And and that's what masonry was in the days of Washington. And there was no, no, um, um, none of this hocus pocus that that has been invented and inserted later. Right. So Um, basically uh, you're asserting that, you know, masonry got hijacked at some point you're saying maybe yeah, 50 years yeah, later yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, I i could see it i could see it both ways but after reading your work and doing basically looking at both sides of the coin and that's what i recommend guys just look at both sides of the coin obviously yeah. these days it's like oh freemason this freemason that like we're we're just like it's funny because the schools don't really talk about this but then we go and do our own research and we get naturally negative emotions and feelings and attitudes towards the founders and i understand why but i'm just saying have an open mind to the other side of the coin because that's what stephen does he presents to you the other side of the coin the hebrew ancestry the different aspects that you you probably didn't find in all those different you know gutters in the internet so okay well um at, at the time of this meeting dr craig took careful notes of what the chief said and the Indian prophecy has been included in many history books ever since. The ancient leather-faced Indian chief had heard that Washington is back in the area and he traveled to meet him explaining, I have traveled a long and weary path that I might see the young warrior of the great battle. And over council fire, the chief declared that he had been a leader of the French 15 years earlier and then recounted a famous battle from his perspective. Uh, etc and uh, well Washington had been specifically targeted and the chief proudly announced that his own rifle had never before been known to miss but after personally firing at Washington 17 times without effect he concluded that Washington was under the care of the great spirit he therefore instructed his braves to stop firing at him confessing to Washington that he had come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven and who can never die in battle. Um, Now, Red Hawk, another Indian chief in the battle, similarly testified that of shooting 11 times at Washington without hitting him. 
and because his gun also never missed his mark, he too ceased firing at him, likewise convinced that the Great Spirit protected him. Now, just 24 years later, in another battle in 1779, the Battle of Brandywine, a similar divine intervention occurred throughout that battle. British Major Patrick Ferguson, a renowned rifle shot and head of the British sharpshooters, quietly moved his men around in the forest, singling out one American after another, shooting them down as the battle proceeded. He pointed out the next target to his men, and he and his three best sharpshooters drew down on the unsuspecting victim. Just before Ferguson ordered them to fire, he experienced a surprising impulse, later recounting that the thought of shooting that particular soldier suddenly disgusted him. The American officer, now in point-blank range, turned and looked directly at Ferguson, locking eyes on him over the sides of Ferguson's rifle. After a few moments, the American slowly turned his horse deliberately showed his fully exposed flank to Ferguson and then calmly cantered away. Ferguson recalled, I could have lodged half a dozen balls in him before he was out of my reach, but I let him live. He later recovered that it had been General George Washington whom he had allowed to live. An uh, earlier historian, Lyman Draper, observed uh, uh, observed of, of, of this incident. Had Washington fallen, it is difficult to calculate its probable, eff probable effect upon the result of the struggle of the American people. This singular impulse of Ferguson illustrates in a forcible manner the overruling hand of providence in directing the operations of a man's mind when he himself is least aware of it so that's that's the amazing uh story of the soldier who could not die <laughs> you know george washington it's right. an amazing story and, and obviously we know because i just showed you that verse from daniel which i i came across that while i was thinking and considering the things that we would be talking about today you know he, god raised him up and 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 he didn't just raise him up he gave him supernatural protection it was a destiny in in a way providence and then he received the vision later which is really what we're going to talk about next because that's you know this is the main focus for today is that this vision that he received let's take let's take a look at when he received it he received it in 1777 at valley forge yeah. I don't know. Do you want to set the stage for this one, Stephen? How do you want to, you want to, how should yeah, we talk Yeah, about I, I actually went on a visit to Valley Forge because of this whole thing. Uh, 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 and uh, I was, I was doing a conference in Philadelphia and, uh, uh, and I, I mentioned the whole story and, and talked about it at that conference. It wasn't the main subject, by the way, but uh, as an aside and uh, from the main platform though, and then, um, there, there was a, 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 a lady who uh, suggested I go to the battlefield, you know, um, at Valley Forge, and uh, and there is an exhibition there, etc. And so I, I went with this lady, and uh, she drove me there, and we looked at all the cabins that were erected by Washington's troops. They had to cut the trees down to create them. Uh, these troops have were so bedraggled that they had. They, many of them didn't have shoes, they just had sort of cloths wound around their feet. It was a very, very uh, sharp winter, uh, uh, f f terrible weather, and uh, a very bleak sight. And um, yeah, of course, Washington had um, uh, lost every battle he'd fought. He'd had a victory at, at Boston, but after Boston, you know, he lost pretty well every battle. Uh, he started out with 15,000 volunteers, and by the time he got to Valley Forge, he was down to about two and a half thousand. And, um, and, and most of those, uh, after Christmas, uh, in the new year, 
they 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 were released from their duty. They had done their mm -hmm. they had done their stint that they had signed up for, and they said half his troops going to leave, and you know in the new year, first of January after Christmas, and this was Christmas just before Christmas. So he was in a desperate situation. He would have been left just with thirteen hundred troops, and. Um, he hadn't got the right weapons. He, he got, just, I think, only about six cannon, and it was just hopeless. Congress had already decided not to fund him anymore, of course, if you consider a bit of a loser. And, uh, and, and so it is in that situation he had his first vision, you know. Uh, you know he, was, he was staring at this guy. Uh, he, he, had, he had instructed... Um, yeah, he had instructed this uh, uh, the, the, his adjutant that he was not to have any visitors. Uh, uh, he was a man of prayer and spent much time in prayer. Right. Actually, and, actually, I have this graphic here. Um, yeah. You know, his soldiers recount that he would pray in the thicket very often. Um, so he was he he obviously. <laughs> How many men of prayer do we have in positions of government these days? Uh, so he's head and shoulders above any leadership that I can think of these days. And one thing I want to mention real quick is as soon as he received the vision, we're going to talk about it in a moment. It fired him up so much yeah. to be able yeah. to actually turn the tides of war in favor of the Americans. It literally changed history. Yeah. yeah. And the, the spirit, well, a lot of people, what I didn't know, Stephen, is that this the, the spiritual climate from which the revolution was won and everything was turned in favor of the Americans? It had to do with a prophetic vision, a prophetic word. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the the first peril, the vision, the, the 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 angel referred to three perils coming to the United States, and he addressed Washington as uh, son of the republic and the irony is there was no republic because uh america was a kingdom uh, it was uh 12, oh, 12, wow. 12, 12 the 12 colonies i didn't uh, think about that uh, the, the yeah it, it, there was no republic then it wasn't a yeah, constitutional republic there was it, no constitution so, so in it, the, there was there was there was no republic and so this this angel prophetically announced him uh, addressed him as son of the republic look and learn and then uh, he he gave um, it, it there is an amazing way in which the uh, uh, Washington describes how how the angel presented himself um, you oh know, I have uh, all that so you didn't see my slides oh, Stephen, but I have that yeah, I'm gonna present yeah. that in a moment so um, he, so I want to I want to share this real quick uh, this yeah. is so you can find what we're about to talk about, what we're about to read, because we're going to read it. How, how cool is that? Are you guys excited to read the original George Washington prophetic vision? Uh, again, like like someone said this in the chat. Yeah, we got to test it. OK, we're going to test it against the word of God. No problem. Uh, but, you know, you shouldn't be like scared and run away from it. Let's look at it. This is what changed the tides of war. This is what actually turned the war in favor of the Americans. They defeated those Hessian troops. The first uh, really defeat of the British were these German mercenaries at Trenton, New Jersey. And so this turned the tide of war. So right here, what I have on screen here is the National Tribune in 1880. That's not the first publish of it. The first publish was in 1859. But what I have on screen is the 1880 version of yeah. the, the, the vision that was published. Uh, it's literally, you know, it's just a newspaper. It was republished again a couple more times, a few more times. <clears throat> excuse me and so let's let's take a look at this um let me set the stage if you don't mind Stephen. let me set the stage um in 1859 a 99 year old officer of washington's named anthony sherman who had served under general washington at valley forge related the vision to a reporter by the name of wesley bradshaw and this is again from page two of your book Stephen. uh sherman is our narrator. So he's the reporter that got this, who, who recorded all of it from the firsthand account of, uh, uh, was it Bradshaw? Or, or no, Sherman. No, I guess Sherman is our narrator and the reporter's the one that recorded it. I'm sorry. 
I'm speaking out of place here, but this is what he says. I want to tell you of an incident of Washington's life on which no one alive knows of except myself. And if you live, you will before long see it verified. George Washington would hardly have been the type of man that one would expect to be seeking visionary manifestations or to be easily taken in by them. From the opening of the revolution, we experienced all phases of fortune, now good and now ill, one time victorious, another time conquered. The darkest period we had, I think, was when Washington, after several reverses, retreated to the Valley Forge, where he resolved to pass the winter of 1777. And then now we're going to get into Washington's words. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on, on what we've already read here, Stephen. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. No, that, 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 that's quite right, yes. Um, you see, it's, 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 uh, the, the nas- uh, it's, it's not without significance and most important for us, for us to note that this vision which describes the civil war uh, and its outcome in perfect detail was published a full two years prior to the outbreak of that war. Uh, and and that that is a reference here to the second vision, but uh, we first need to discuss the first the first vision, and the first vision is called the first peril. And so Washington was working at his desk in in his command tent, uh, and uh, and uh, a person he had been he instructed his adjutant that under no circumstances he was to be disturbed. And then uh, he noticed that there was a person standing in the entrance of his uh, a tent, uh, a, a, a person of commanding presence, uh, as, as he describes, a, a person of extraordinary uh, beauty, handsomeness, and, um, and, and there was an incredible aura, uh, so much so that Washington was left completely speechless, and um, and then the person addressed him as son of the republic. Look mm-hmm. and learn, and with that, and at that moment, I beheld a sh- dark, shadowy being like an angel floating in midair between Europe and America. Well, let, let's take a look. Let's take a look at this first. <clears throat> yeah. So this is where I was going to I was going to throw a curveball at you, Stephen. Hopefully you don't okay. mind. Okay, no, you're welcome. Look, you're 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 the one who is in charge. <laughs> I, I'm just your donkey. No worries. <laughs> well, so the vision is three parts, guys, three parts. OK, yeah. we're going to look at all three, but I want to jump to the interpretation first because we don't have to guess what the interpretation is. The angel that appeared to George Washington tells us the interpretation. So let's look at it first. This is what the, the, the interpretation is. The scene instantly began to fade and dissolve, and I at last saw nothing but the rising, curling vapor I at first beheld. This also disappearing. I found myself once more gazing upon the mysterious visitor, that woman that you were just mentioning, Stephen, that angel woman, the mysterious visitor who in the same voice I had heard before say, son of the Republic, what you have seen is thus interpreted. Three great perils will come upon the Republic. The most fearful is the third passing, which the whole world united shall not prevail against her. Let every child of the Republic learn to live for his God, his land and his union. With these words, the vision vanished and I started from my seat and felt that I had seen a vision wherein had been shown to me the birth, progress, and destiny of the United States. So that's Washington words, his words, Washington. And then here's the narrator again. Such, my friends, concluded the venerable narrator were the words I had heard from Washington's own lips, and America will do well to profit by them. So the birth, progress, and destiny of the United States. Let's look at the first peril. Go ahead, Stephen. You can read from the screen. <clears throat> you can paraphrase by all means, and this is what it looks like, guys. Verbatim, this is what it looks like, the first peril of the vision. Uh, presently, I heard a voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. While at the same time, my visitor extended 
her arm eastwardly, and now beheld a heavy white vapor at some distance rising fold upon fold. And this gradually dissipated, and I looked upon a strange scene. Before me lay spread out in one vast plain all the countries of the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. And I saw rolling and tossing between Europe and America the billows of the Atlantic, and between Asia and America lay the Pacific. Son of the Republic, said the same mysterious voice as before look and learn at that moment i beheld a dark shadowy being like an angel standing or rather floating in mid-air between europe and america dipping water out of the ocean in the hollow of each hand he sprinkled some upon america with his right hand while with his left hand he cast some on europe immediately a cloud raised from these countries and joined in mid-ocean for a while it remained stationary and then moved slowly westward until it enveloped america in its murky folds sharp flashes of lightning gleamed through it at intervals and i heard the smothered groans and cries of the american people a second time the angel dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it out as before the dark cloud was then drawn back to the ocean, in whose heaving billows it sank from view. So, and th and then we're going to go to the second peril. Uh, so yeah, go yeah. go ahead and explain this one to us. I think it, you know probably some of you have already connected the dots. Maybe you already have, but go ahead uh, and ex explain this. Yeah, one the us. thing is, the thing is that. Uh, Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. We go there. We go to the second parallel. Have you got it there? Yeah, yeah. The second one. Let's take a look at it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, at, at a third time, I heard a mysterious voice say, saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. I cast my eyes upon America and beheld villages and towns and cities springing up one after the other, until the whole land from the Atlantic to the Pacific was dotted with them. Again, I heard the mysterious voice say, Son of the Republic, the end of the century cometh. Look and learn. At this dark shadowy angel turned his face southward. And from Africa, I saw an ill omen specter approach our land. It fitted, fitted flitted slowly over every town and city of the latter. The inhabitants presently set themselves in battle array against each other. As I continued looking, I saw a bright angel on whose brow rested a crown of light on which was traced the word Union, bearing the American flag, which he placed between the divided nation and said, Remember, ye are brethren. Instantly, the inhabitants, casting from them their weapons, became friends once more and united around the national standard. Did you did you want to interpret the first and second one for us, Stephen, or you want to go to the third one already? <clears throat> no, no, there, there was, um, uh, he, he mentioned something uh from from uh sea to shining sea you know uh in in the first one did i skip it i know i uh i may have not done such a good job copying it uh, this at the line in the line in the first parallel the, the final words were uh look and learn uh son of the republic look and learn i cast my eyes upon america and beheld villages and towns and cities springing up one after the other until the whole land from the Atlantic to the Pacific was dotted with them. Now, yeah, I have it right uh, here at the top of the second peril. Yep. Uh, yeah. So that, that I went on to comment uh, and question indeed, how did what George Washington know in 1777 
when he received his vision that America would stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and that is to say, from sea to shining sea. After all, it would be a further 26 years before the Louisiana Purchase took place in 1803 to make any idea of settlement in the West even remotely possible. The Ameri first American overland expedition to the Pacific coast led by Lewis and Clark reached the mouth of the Columbia River and the Pacific a few years later in December of 1805. It was only after these historic events that Washington's 1777 vision of the whole land being dotted with villages, towns, and cities from the Atlantic to the Pacific could possibly be fulfilled. Hence, this part of the vision clearly contained a prophetic statement which no one person at the time could ever have foreseen. In this, we have an indication that Washington's vision may have been genuine. Right. And so, so basically, they didn't even survey the land yet. Did, are you catching that for the listeners? Like the, the land wasn't even surveyed yet when they hadn't received... acquired the land yet. They hadn't <laughs> acquired the land yet. They hadn't acquired it. They haven't even caught like they're still under the king. Uh, uh, I forget which who it, who it was uh, of England. The crown. They're still under the crown. They're being taxed. Taxation without representation. Yeah. And this land hasn't even been surveyed yet. And so for him to see villages from sea to shining sea, from one end to the other end, from Atlantic to Pacific is what it says. We have it on screen there. It's the fourth line from the from the top. Atlantic to Pacific. It's it's just it's impossible, guys. OK, so it, it's a it was a legitimate vision. Now, let's we're going to take a look and see maybe some of the other nuances of it, because it really the third peril. I already showed you guys the interpretation, right? The third peril is the far is the worst. It's the scariest and it's coming upon us and this generation, which is why this is such a timely message for us. Um, but go ahead and interpret the first peril for us, uh, Stephen. The third peril, yes. Or the, the first is the Revolutionary War, basically, right? Europe and America. The, the first is the Revolutionary War, yes, indeed. Uh, the war against the British. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, it, it's rather interesting because w what you have here is the, the history of Israel repeating itself in America. Because, um, you know, Israel was a united kingdom, uh, as indeed was the, the later British United Kingdom. Um, and, but Israel uh, was a, an empire at the time. Uh, it was a, a, a ruling empire, especially under King David and King Solomon. And um, it stretched from the Nile to the Euphrates at the time. And, and the, uh, Solomon had many vassal kings, kings who served him and were subject to him and so forth. And so did David before Solomon. But Solomon really expanded the empire. And uh, so um, it, it was a ruling empire, but it was a kingdom. And it was a united kingdom composed of 12 tribes. Rather interesting that... America was established by 12 colonies. That's a rather interesting analogy, isn't it? And then oh, it's just coincidence, right, Stephen? Yeah, <laughs> I don't believe in coincidences. Not not in history. I do not. Uh, not I in history, think, guys. Yeah, I not don't in really history. Do anywhere really else good. either. Yeah. So you know, um, the 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 situation is that um, uh, Britain was in charge of America at the time. The 12 colonies were English colonies and they were subject to the King of England. And so when the angel said, son of the Republic, uh, that, 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 that statement itself was a prophecy, right? And right. Uh, all, yeah, so much, so much prophecy and all those words. There, there, was, there was no Republic at the time when he, the angel addressed Washington as a son of the Republic. But he was, was going to be the son of the Republic Yes, of course he was. And it was truly prophetic, that statement. But there it is. It must have sounded slightly strange to Washington's ears. Um, but, uh, but there it is. Um, the, 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 the whole thing was that when, when Washington got to Valley Forge, he was a defeated foe. Right? And as, when he got these visions, particularly the third vision, well, 
in this case, in his case, the first vision gave him the courage to do what he did at Valley Forge. Uh, gave him the courage to immediately uh, gather his 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 troops and 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 speak to them and and give orders and set the whole process in motion to try and conquer that that Hessian fort where the King of England had hired Hessian troops because he had problems hiring Englishmen to do his dirty work, so mm. he hired German mercenary troops who were seasoned fighters, trained fighters. They were professional fighters, right? They had been fighting all their lives. Uh, the leader of the the garrison at, at Valley Forge was um, 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 uh, was uh, a guy who had 36 years of experience as an officer in the field. All over Europe he'd fought. And so his troops were of a similar kind. And so those are the troops that Washington was up against. And uh, But when he'd had the vision, the first peril vision from the angel, um, he, he decided that he was going to go for it. So he marshaled his troops and he, he, he traveled with his entire company, two and a half thousand, with his six, or, I think, six or nine cannons on, on rafts crossing this icy Delaware River about nine miles from where they were going to have to tackle the enemy uh, and, and then have to walk, walk through snow uh, and with terrible uh, uh, facilities and terrible equipment and everything about it was just pathetic. It was a pathetic, struggling army. But mm -hmm. Washington imbued them with his vision and with his his leadership, uh, and uh, and uh, he he really galvanized those troops in into this battle, and it was Christmas, right? They they crossed on Christmas Eve, and they uh, and they they got there the, the next morning at about eight o'clock. He wanted to surprise them at at uh, midnight, but that didn't work out. So he got there at eight <laughs> in the morning. Nevertheless, they surprised them. And uh, in fact, the, the commander had been warned that Washington was coming. And um, when, they, when they found his dead body, uh, they found a note in his pocket where he, it said that Washington and his troops are coming to see you uh, today. And um, his reaction was, when he got the message, he, his reaction apparently was, let them come. You know, he didn't fear Washington's ragtag army in the slightest. They'll make mincemeat of them. But <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. result was very, very different. Pride comes before the fall. Once again, we see it all the time in history. Yep. No, so, I mean, I don't know if you guys paid attention to the photos here, but that's an icy river there crossing the Delaware, that pure ice. Uh uh, you know, they didn't even have shoes. Some of the soldiers didn't have shoes. They put like burlap sacks over their feet and they're all bloody and they're just like leaving a trail of blood behind them in the snow when they're walking. So this American army was uh, like Stephen correctly says, just a ragtag group of patriots. And it was pretty it's a pretty pathetic thing. It, impossible odds. OK, that's the point. Impossible odds. And they they emerged victorious and they weren't no, no one expected them to come there like that okay but this vision that he received again there's the angel again with the word union on the on the golden headband that w the american flag in one hand the sword in the other the vision uh he, he empowered the troops with those with the vision that he received and um so that's the first peril you want to talk about the second peril and what that means brother steven yeah the second peril Let's, uh, you've got it on screen. Um, uh, the third time, have, have I not read this already? Yeah, we read it already. Um, this has to do with, well, what's interesting is you, you the way you have it in the book, it's bolded properly. I didn't do it that way in the slide, but, um, oh, where is it? I'm looking for it. Remember that year, brethren, because... 
the dark shadowy angel turned his face southward and from africa he saw an ill omened spectre oh yeah that's that's early. interesting isn't it because the said uh, the civil war was really about the the slave this the slave trade it was about uh slavery and and uh uh, you know, Lincoln wanted to uh, uh, abandon slavery, he wanted to give the slaves their freedom. And um, yeah, this is what the war was about. Um, and, uh, you know, so. Um, yeah, and it says that the American flag was placed between the divided nation. Yeah. And so it was predicted that the nation would be divided over something that has to do from africa yeah yeah it, over every town and every city and that's exactly what happened north versus south confederacy versus the whatever the yankees right yeah it and was so, uh, six hundred thousand casualties it was the most serious war yeah it was no, no joke and so uh when you look at these things like what what is what's the odds of this being coincidence or just a random guess that he knew that okay there's the revolutionary war we're going to win all the cities and villages are going to pop up from one coast to the other coast then you have north versus south over something that has to do with something from africa and the, everybody's going to be basically divided there's gonna be a divided nation but they're going to remember that they're brethren and they're going to stop. They're going to put their weapons down. They're going to become friends again and gather around the national standard, the American flag. Come on, man. You know, like <laughs> it, it, it was really uh, the whole thing was miraculous. Uh, uh, it was very sad how it started. Uh, and and it, it, but it was amazing how it finished. You know, um, uh, I've written another book about uh, about about this. Uh, and uh, with much more detail, but the way that the transfer happened and the way the South uh, uh, submitted to the North and the way the North didn't uh, exact any uh, revenge on, on the leaders of the, of the rebellion in the South and uh, that they were able to carry on as normal citizens, etc. And um, I know there were some very serious wounds that went very deep but over time time is a great healer uh, and the nation is sort of healed up and and become uh, a, a coherent uh, a nation uh, and uh, a united nation and um, uh, it became the greatest the greatest nation on the face of the earth um, the one and only superpower on the earth uh, and uh, uh, another amazing situation was how the British Empire, uh, having lost uh, America, immediately started another empire in India and, 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 and in the Far East. Uh, it lost one empire and gained another. And um, how, how, how these two uh, brother English-speaking na English nations uh, uh, became allies and friends um, and the, the, the handover of the British Empire uh, to the American Empire happened during the Second World War. And uh, it was a seamless handover, really. Uh, there was no other war between Britain and America to, to decide who was going to be boss. Uh, <laughs> Britain just seamlessly handed over the baton of leadership to the United States. And the United States has been the leader of the West ever since. But it's very clear that she's about to lose her, lose her leadership altogether, and so so is Britain. Um, and uh, th these two nations are representative of the two sons of Joseph, and they have inherited the birthright, and they become the the, the, the senior ruling nations of the earth in in the latter half of of um, our, our 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 century. Uh, are, are two centuries, really, two, two and a half centuries, they have ruled the world, these two. And uh, first Britain, which is Ephraim, uh, who was the younger son, but Jacob raised Ephraim above Manasseh by placing his right hand on Manasseh's head as he blessed the two sons of Joseph. And then Manasseh, that, that follows from that, that Ephraim would rise to prominence first, 
and uh, as indeed did Great Britain uh, and the British Empire. And then uh, it follows that Manasseh would take over, and Manasseh did take over, America did take over, and has ruled the world ever since the Second World War. Um, so it, it's an amazing story of prophecy. All of it is, is prophecy, really. History, uh, if you look at the word history, when you divide the word history, you take the word his, and then you take the word story and history is his story it is jehovah's story right history yeah. is jehovah's story because Absolutely. he appoints all the kings he appoints all the rulers and he is in control he's also in charge uh and nothing happens that is that is that it is totally accidental you know everything is designed behind everything that happens and he is the great architect he's the great designer and the great originator and the great creator yeah. uh so you know world history is his story that's the amazing thing about it yeah and i want to i want to jump in here and just piggyback off of that Stephen, because we reject i reject revisionist history meaning oh the elites are so powerful they've rewritten history we can't really know the truth okay that's that's a total lie of the enemy that's that's used to confuse people we reject revisionist history here the truth always comes out. It's like water. It's always going to find its level. It's always going to come out. You can't contain the truth. It's always going to come out. There's always going to be a voice. There's always going to be a leader. There's always going to be a prophetic message. There's always going to be God's people doing his work because he's on the throne. And what's interesting to me, Stephen, is that when, it, when we're talking about Ephraim, the UK, Britain, and Manasseh, America, think about how dorm, it, that prophecy has been in Genesis uh, oh, what is it? Chapter 38, 39, 40, right around there. It, it, it was dormant for so many years. And all of a sudden, we're at the end of history. We're at the end of mankind. And all of a sudden, we finally see the manifestation of those of those prophecies of, of the firstborn blessing of Manasseh rising up. And I want to take a moment here to read what, what Abraham Lincoln had to say, right? Yeah. Yeah, quite. Because America plays a central role in prophecy, and you cannot get away from it. Again, <laughs> nothing is by... I, I like what you said, Stephen. It's so good. Nothing is by chance. Or, or When you see patterns in history, uh, yeah. it, it's not an accident, okay? It's God's fingerprints. So look at what Abraham Lincoln says. This is from your book as well, page 49. We have yeah. been the recipients of the choicest blessings of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in number, wealth, and power as no other nation has uh, ever has grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with our unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient and feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace too proud to pray to the God that made us that. I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. Doesn't that a perfect reflection of what's going on right now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And nothing new under the sun. In fact, he said it all. <laughs> Those words are just as applicable today as they were then. Yeah. Perhaps and even more so. Even more so. And then I would say, Again, what Abraham Lincoln is saying here, I'm not sure, you know, as I have not done my research on it, I don't know if he knew about the two houses of Israel. I don't know if Abraham Lincoln knew the things that we're talking about with the 12 tribes, uh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the kingdom of Israel that's divided into two. Judah came back. The kingdom of Israel never came back. That's why Jesus said, I've come to save those lost sheep from the house of Israel, from the kingdom of Israel. He came to save those lost sheep. They never came back from captivity from Assyria. And a lot of those folks, guess where they ended up? Well, they ended up right here. And they received the choicest blessings of heaven, just as was prophesied to Abraham, right? That his descendants yeah. would bless the nations. And it's just uh, the connections are mind-blowing. You did such a good job connecting so many different dots with American history. And that's why, guys, I can't, I can't stop just recommending this right here. Uh, you can get it. Where, where can people get your book? Is it your website that's the best place to get it, by the way? We haven't even talked about that. 
uh, you it's best go to Amazon. It's it's on Amazon. Uh, you can see it on the website. Yes, and you can you can you can you can buy it there. But you you have to pay Amazon. You can't pay me for it because. Uh, uh, you know, it is actually published by Amazon. And, okay. Um, yeah. So, so th again, this is what we're talking about today, guys. Again, just to re re you know remind you, George Washington's prophetic I vision. And it's twenty-one dollars. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. And it's relevant. That, that may seem like a lot of money, but it, the reason it is twenty-one dollars because it's full color production, and you always have to pay extra for color. Oh yeah, I know that. Yeah. Now that I've yeah. published yeah. the book myself, I <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And it has great, again, great color images, guys. Very, very, it's very well done. And um, I would, what was I going to say? Oh, you know, I forgot to ask you, Stephen. Why did you? I I know I know why. <laughs> I know why I would have called the book its relevance to 2020s America, but why not 2030s America? Why not 2040s America? Why did you, why, why did the Holy Spirit inspire you to say 2020s America? And I agree with it. I'm just wondering how, it's like, why you were like that. I, I wrote it in 2020. Mm. Mm. So I wrote it for this, for this, this time. Did you realize how crazy things were going to get? Oh yes, yes, yes. I, I I I absolutely knew that. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm still surprised. I'm still surprised by some of the excesses sometimes. But mm. uh, you know, I think uh, it's been all been prophesied. If you understand the prophecies, there's nothing new under the sun. It's all been prophesied. Right, right. So, well, with that said, let's take a look at the third peril, shall we? Here comes the third peril. This is the and one it, again. This is the one that it, it applies to now. It's the yeah, most dreadful. Yeah. This is this is this is a word for today. And again, I heard the mysterious voice saying, "Son of the Republic, look and learn." At this dark, the dark shadowy angel placed a trumpet to his mouth and blew three distinct blasts. And taking water from the ocean, he sprinkled it upon Europe, Asia, and Africa. Then my eyes beheld a fearful scene. From each of these countries arose thick black clouds that were soon joined into one. And throughout this mass, there gleamed a dark red light by which I saw hordes of armed men who, moving with the cloud, marched by land and sailed by sea to America, which country was enveloped in the volume of cloud. And I dimly saw these vast armies devastate the whole country and burn the villages, towns, and cities that I beheld springing up. As my ears listened to the thundering of the cannon, uh, clashing of swords, and the shouts and cries of millions in mortal combat, I heard again the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. And when the voice had ceased, the dark shadowy angel placed his trumpet once more to his mouth and blew a long and fearful blast. Now we have the, what happens next. Heaven intervenes. This is what happens instantly, next. But... Yeah, instantly. Oh, yeah. Uh, you you, you want to yeah, jump over to that? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Instantly a light as of a thousand suns shone down from above me and pierced and broke into fragments the dark cloud which enveloped America. At the same moment, the angel upon whose head still shone the word union and who bore our national flag in one hand and a sword in the other, descended from the heavens attended by legions of white spirits. These immediately joined the inhabitants of America who I perceived were well nigh overcome, but who immediately taking courage again, closed up their broken ranks and renewed the battle. Again, amid the fearful noise of the conflict, I heard a mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. As the voice ceased, the shadowy angel of the last, for the last time dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it upon America. Instantly, the dark cloud rolled back together with the armies it had brought, leaving the inhabitants of the land victorious. 
Then once more I beheld the villages, towns and cities springing up where I had seen them before, while the bright angel planting the azure standard he had brought in the midst of them cried with a loud voice, while the stars remain and the heavens send down dew upon the earth, so long shall the union last. And taking from his brow the crown on which ablazoned the word union, he placed it upon the standard while the people kneeling down said, Amen. And there you Amen. have it, guys. That's the whole vision. We looked at the first peril. That's the Revolutionary War that was won. There was villages that sprang up from coast to coast. Then we had the Civil War, North versus South, that we became brothers again. The country didn't completely fall apart. It wasn't permanently divided. It was just temporarily divided. Then we have the third peril. And let me, let me show you graphically what that looks like again. This is the thumbnail for today, right? It looks something like that. A dark red light, cries of millions of mortal combat, things burned, millions of, of armies of millions of soldiers. Uh, did you see, uh, I don't know how closely you follow the Telegram announcements. I know you're a busy man, huh, Stephen? But I did post this. This is from Hal Turner uh, Radio Show. Na Office of Naval Intelligence League, China building naval ships 232 times faster than the USA to invade North America. Okay. Uh, did you see this one? No, I didn't. No, I didn't see that one. No. Yeah. Th so this is something that I don't know if you're familiar with Joel Skousen, uh, worldaffairsbrief.com, uh, author of Strategic Relocation. Are you familiar with his work? Uh, no, not really. I've heard of him, but I, I, I don't follow. I haven't followed him. Yeah, well, he, uh, you know, he has a military background. He's a patriot, you know, and uh, he's also a Mormon guy. He's got he's very good in information when it comes to survival, prepping and preparedness, that sort of thing. But he gives a lot of insight into geopolitics and stuff like that. He, yeah. He's been talking about this since 2012, this type of thing. Uh, China, uh, what it says here, China is building this enormous amount of lift to be able to field a 200 million man army to invade and conquer North America, which it needs for food production and for its gigantic and growing population. I'm curious, uh, Brother Stephen, when you read the vision that Washington had, uh, what came to your mind? Were you thinking Russia, China, a combination of the two? What, what nations came to your mind when you started thinking about this, this prophecy? Uh, well, it, it seems that uh, uh, Russia and and, uh, and China are, are the main the main sort of culprits, but they're assisted by a whole host of other nations and people, um, including uh, including is Islam and uh, also very much the uh, the, uh, the nations from South America who have quite a few beefs with the United States. It's true. Yeah, it is true. And then you have, like you said, the Islamic... Everyone, everyone will be jumping on the bandwagon, right? It's, it's, it is... it is uh, They all want to be in on the death, on the death of America. Yeah, and then one thing that... I know you've probably paid attention to this, but man, uh, sleepy Joe Biden, he's been very excellent at leaving that border open. And so we've had... Yeah, just... yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, who knows how many... Uh, soldiers are already in the States right now. Right. It, th th uh, this article claims there's been a 900% increase in, in Chinese military age men c crossing. Yeah. 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 Uh, it is, um, it is, uh, it, it is uh, very much in the works. Uh, and I, I, I believe that the attack may well be imminent and uh, also that it will be nuclear in, in, in part, some of the major cities are going to be taken out. And uh, really, uh, George, George Washington is not the only one to prophesy uh, the, the conquest of America and the destruction of America. There are a number of other prophets, modern day prophets, mm -hmm. who have uh, made the same case. And uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's quite a few of them. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we have all kinds of problems here in the in the country. Um, you know, recently, I was at a I was at a, a laundromat in a particular town um, in New Mexico, 
and it was kind of strange. There was there was military aged. Uh, I'm not joking, by the way. This is a true story. God's my witness. But there was two military aged uh, uh, Oriental Chinese men uh, that literally they couldn't speak any English. They but they they spoke in a dialect or some kind of a yeah. They just spoke Mandarin or whatever it is uh, Chinese in a way that I had had never heard before. And they 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 just weren't. You could tell they were just foreign and they're military aged and it's just it was really strange i was like wow all those articles i've been reading are true like in this random town there's I, i'm just seeing because i am closer to the border you know um i'm just i'm seeing this type of activity but like the border's been wide open uh like you said latin america islamic countries the different types of everybody everybody's gonna jump the bandwagon when this really goes down uh and so the 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 red light are you under the impression that the red light that he talks about the dark red light is uh some kind of a military technology nukes something like that uh, uh, yeah i i uh, i it, it it is a very mysterious thing the the red light and uh, somebody said that something to do with nukes um other people have suggested it might be something to do with um a type of gas they use or electronic electronic uh, weapons that they use um i, I really have no idea <laughs> mm. but mm -hmm. uh what what i do know is that um the, the the bible prophesies that america will go into captivity people of america will go into captivity in fact all israelite nations will will suffer the same fate it's it's um it, it's under it, it comes under the heading of the time of jacob's trouble and uh, so what's the time of jacob's trouble the time of jacob's trouble is when all the sons of jacob and he had 12 sons which developed into 12 tribes and those 12 tribes constituted the the, the whole nation of israel and uh, and and what would the israel you see today in the middle east is 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 just uh, uh, you know just a, a very small speck uh, on on the map, and it, it does not constitute Israel per se. It's a, it's a Jewish state. It doesn't constitute all of Judah either, because these tribes have have been growing into full grown tribes uh, since they left Egypt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was a long time ago. And so they're, they're huge population. Every tribe is a huge population group. I think the Israelites in the world today probably number about two and a half billion Israelites in the world today. And uh, the American population is 330 million. It's only a, a small composition of, of the totality of Israel in the world today. And, uh, and of course, they've lost their identity Absolutely. And and, yep. and the only people who retain their identity among the Israelites are the Jews, and the thing that helps them to uh, uh, maintain their identity is the fact that they keep the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, that identifies them as being Israel, uh, whereas all the other Israelites have walked away from that, and uh, a long time ago, uh, since uh, 722 A.D. They walked away from that and uh, they've gone into captivity as a result and uh, they are spread to the four corners of the earth. 100%, and, uh, yeah. And uh, America is an Israelite nation, as, as are all English-speaking nations are Israelite nations. And um, there are many other nations who are full of Israelites, um, uh, but, you know, they've lost their identity. Uh, yeah, obvi obviously Europe Europe has a lot of Israelite blood as well, yeah, like yeah. right? Because I found a lot of that in my research. What have you found there? I mean, a mixture. It's a mixture, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, in in uh, in 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 Asia also, India has huge po uh, Israelite populations, and uh, and Pakistan and and uh, you know uh, Japan. Uh, uh, every the Israelites are everywhere. So um, Stephen, and you, no. God knows exactly who they are and where they are. But the problem is that Satan also knows who they are and where they are. Mm. You mm. know, 
Hitler was, was very much inspired by Satan when he decided he wanted to kill all the Jews in the world. That was his mission and that was his, uh, his, uh, his, his um, absolutely dedicated to doing that. That's the reason why he was alive. He had to kill all the Jews, eradicate them, exterminate them, etc. Well, he, he did his best to do that, but he only managed to kill six million of them and he used an industrial method to do it, etc. The thing is that what Hitler did to the Jews was a pilot program. It was a pilot program for what Satan plans to do with the Israelites, right? The Israelites mm -hmm. in the world. That means uh, all Americans, all Brits, all, all, all French, and so forth, and so forth, uh, all the Israelite nations are going to be conquered and defeated and are going to go into captivity. That's what the prophets of Israel say. That's what Jeremiah says, what Isaiah says, what Ezekiel says. Pretty much all the prophets say it. Even David says it in, in, in some of his Psalms. Mm. So mm. the future of Israel is that you are going to be punished for your disobedience by the God of Israel. It's God's plan that you are punished. And he's punishing you in love, although it doesn't look like it on the face of it when you're at the receiving end. It is still designed to bring you around. It's designed to arrest you. It's designed to help you stand still and think about who you are and what you are and who God is and how important he is. And mm -hmm. that he is the future uh, and, and, and we need to fall into line with him and with his future. And his future is to establish a new world. He's going to overturn this world altogether. This world is, is being given its notice to quit. And so is Satan. He's going to be locked up for a thousand years when he can't move to the right or the left. And God is going to rule through his son, who is Yeshua, also called Jesus by Christians, etc. And uh, so this is a new world that's coming. And because this new world is coming, the old world has to be cleaned up and tidied up. <laughs> and and, and it has, the, the people in it have to repent. And if they don't repent, well, they're going to be, well, they're going to be finished. Uh, their lives are going to be finished. And um, well, that's that this God is all powerful. And he created man in his image and after his likeness. No matter how much the evolutionists like to deny it, evolution is a demonic theory. And it, it comes from the, the heart of Satan, who hates God, and who is in total rebellion against him. And uh, so this is all about that. This, this, this whole thing that's happening to America uh, and to the rest of the Western world, say, and, mm -hmm. and certainly to to Christianity at large, say, um, because I believe that most most of Christianity, the origin of most of Christianity is Israelite, right? It springs from Israel, it comes from Israel, it originates from Israel. Yeshua was an Israelite, he was a, an Israelite Jew uh, from the house of Judah, uh, from the line of King David. And, and he is going to come again to establish his kingdom here upon the earth. And uh, in that kingdom, there will be no war. There will be, there will be no thieving, no stealing. There will be no immorality. Uh, that the animal, even the animal kingdom will be at peace. Uh, you know, uh, it, 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 nature will be at peace. Everything will be in harmony. It's going to be the restoration of paradise. Paradise will be restored. Yeah, no, no more. You know what I'm looking forward to? No more scarcity and no more competition. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you see, it's uh, human nature has been the enemy of humanity. And the, the reason for that is that human nature is influenced by the enemy, Hasatan, you know. And so we got somebody saying hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Yeah, brother. And and so, Stephen, uh, I just want to uh, just going off what you said, just to add to it, 
if you're listening to this and you know you're on the fence or you're just like maybe a lot of this is new and you don't know if you've 100 percent surrendered not not that that's a bad thing but come into agreement align your your life with yeshua's will if you don't know if you've done that it's a simple prayer away okay it's saying yeshua yes i i want i want you to be lord of my life i want to come under your kingship under your authority so that actually i can actually experience all the blessings that you said abundant life a light and easy yoke his burden is very light what satan does is he tries to confuse and make you think that if you give your life to god if you want to serve God, it's going to be cruel. It's going to be dead. It's going to be boring, religious, and it's going to be crusty. It's going to be unfulfilling. But everything that I just described is is what it, life is like when you're doing what's good in your eyes, when you're following after the God of this world, Satan, when you're doing all those types of things, that's crusty. That's dead. That's unfulfilling. The true fulfillment is found at the cross. The true fulfillment is found in Yeshua, 100%. I can testify to that. A lot of addictions that I had to deal with, Yeshua took care of them. He's met all of my needs, uh, spiritual needs, physical needs, food, clothing, everything has been provided to me. I know Stephen feels the same way. So if you're on the yeah. fence about God, about Yeshua, about whether or not you should go all in, go all in. Okay. The, today's the chant. This is what this is all about at the end of the day. We look at these prophetic warnings, these prophetic messages so that we can learn to take heed to the warning and get right with our creator we get right with our maker because that's where the glory is that's where the blessing is that's where the fulfillment is everything and so i want to go back to this Stephen. uh what 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 george washington was shown in his vision is that nations from europe asia and africa are gonna devastate the u.s and western countries let's just say because obviously the uk is going to be involved with this it's it's all western countries it's israelite israelites are going to be punished scattered lost tribes that don't even know who they are necessarily they're going to be punished we see this right now with nato versus BRICS, right BRICS plus we're seeing this so it's pretty when i look at this it's pretty clear okay africa you got uh uh what african nations you got libya egypt you got a few mentioned in prophecy middle east you got definitely countries saudi you got different countries coming against the west Iran, Asia, definitely China, uh, obviously Mongolia. Uh, and then you've got, see, this is this is where I have a question. Who do you think from Europe is going to play a role in this? Do you think when this was given to Washington that uh, Russia is grouped into that whole identity of Europe also? Because it's like considered greater Europe, right? Ukraine getting into Russia. Or who, who do you think it was talking about with Europe? I know this is kind of a trickier question here, but I'm curious. Well, the, 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 it all goes back to, to uh, um, the children of Israel, and it goes back to uh, 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 Jacob, who had a, a brother called Esau. And Esau was um, um, an enemy of Jacob, uh, sworn Esau swore that he would kill Jacob, uh, and uh, that was a prophetic statement. Uh, Esau is going to get the upper hand. Uh, Jacob is the brother who's ruled uh, and who's been blessed, and who in, who is given who is given the blessing uh, uh, from 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 his father Isaac, and beyond that, the blessing of Abraham has descended via Isaac to Jacob and it didn't go to Esau even though Esau was born before Jacob and uh, the the result is that there's this hatred between Esau and Jacob now Jacob is the one who has been the ruler really the ruling tribe in 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 the world and uh, Esau has been subject to him but the prophecy that Isaac, Isaac eventually spoke over uh, over Esau was that in the end he would throw off his brother's yoke. Right? Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I do remember that prophecy. He'd throw off his brother's yoke. Well, what you see that this war against America is is going to be uh, Esau coming against Jacob, America being Jacob, Esau being. Uh, Russia being um, uh, Assyria 
Australia being all the German tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, I being, can see that. Yep. Uh, being all of Islam, because all of it, uh, not not the Iranian form of Islam, not Shiite Islam, but Sunni Islam, which is the Islam that centered on Saudi Arabia and all the other nations that are allied uh, with the Sunnis. So Shiite Islam is a minority party within greater Islam. So allied with Esau, he married into, into that tribe. And, uh, and uh, uh, so Sunni Islam, and then you got uh, the uh, European nations, uh, which may include many nations uh, that are satellites of Russia. Um, mm. Russia is also Esau in that the, uh, uh, the Russian royal family is descended from, from, from that line. Mm. Uh, and uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, the, the Chinese, of course, are in there. Um, you, you know what I've noticed, Stephen? You know what I've noticed is like when you look at some of the heraldry of Russians, whether it's St. Petersburg, different last names and St. Petersburg yeah. or just different flags and emblems, they have a double headed eagle, which yeah. is the same thing as Assyria, which yeah. also kind of goes back to Esau as well, right? Yeah, it okay. does. Yes, yeah, the double headed eagle goes back to Asia. Then there's also the Vatican is Esau, Rome, Rome is Esau. Which is um, European, yeah. So a son, a son of Esau founded Rome. Actually, he mm. founded the Roman Empire, and uh, before it was an empire. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, it, this is a uh, this is ancient ancient history is is having its final say, uh, and it, it's you know, it's the Esau is the enemy of Jacob, and he is now getting the upper hand. And he's going to go for Jacob, and God is allowing him to do it. He is allowing the, to get the upper hand over Jacob, which are the Israelite nations. They are descended from Jacob, and uh, so that's that's the world struggle that's that's good, uh, ongoing at the moment. And so, um, the the thing is that when Esau takes Jacob into captivity, which he will do. And it's the history that is unfolding at the moment. God has got an escape plan for Jacob. And that escape plan is the Exodus. Just as he allowed the Israelites to escape from Pharaoh in ancient Egypt, from their bondage over there, he's going to allow his people to escape from Esau's bondage. Wait, wait, and Stephen, hold on. I got to hold, I got to slow you down. Um, because there's something I want to share. And I want to show something from Stephen's book as well, guys. I got a real treat for you. It is a connection. There's so many connections in Stephen's work that'll blow your mind. I want to share one with you that profoundly impacted me uh, when I first read uh, uh, George Washington's prophetic vision. Just remember, guys, what we're really talking about with the third peril is the Great Tribulation, right? Time of Jacob's trouble. Same thing. Would you, would you agree with that, Stephen? No, I would not. No, okay, all not, right. It's, it's not the same thing because I believe the time of Jacob's trouble comes before the Great Tribulation mm -hmm. and that the people who are going and coming through Jacob's trouble won't have to go through the Great Tribulation. So the mm -hmm. remnants yeah. that come through Jacob's trouble won't have to go through the Great Tribulation. So there's two different periods. Two different periods. Interesting. Uh, do you have uh, do you have more on that on on that take on that interpretation? Uh, well, um, well, yeah. I mean, well, how... like, where, where could I find? Where could I read more about that? Well, uh, well, uh, yeah. I, I, maybe I'll tell you that privately. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I don't know if you sprinkled it in one of your books or uh, uh, that sort of thing. So, well, I, th I thought I'd ask. Well, okay. No worries, Steve. <laughs> no worries, brother. Well, I just want to remind you guys of kind of some of the things we talked about on the channel here. Uh, we're going looking at the middle of the week. Remember, 2020 was the middle of the 70th week of Daniel. Yeah. There was an end of Zebach and Mincha. We've talked about this. We count 1290 at some point, right? Obviously, September 22 
was not the the beginning of the abomination being set up uh uh but what we do know is that from the spring of 2020 somewhere in 2020 i'm saying it's the spring so the winter of 2023 will fulfill the words of yeshua saying hey there's going to be a fleeing in the in the winter okay or it's, it's a sabbath and a winter and then there's going to be great tribulation so i think based off of what i've seen from the book it lines up with great tribulation being the same as jacob's trouble uh uh but hey guys look it, it, you know we're all trying to understand these things they're not easy to understand these are ancient words here uh you know the thousands of years old and so basically it, it, the reason it's in two it's in two stages that uh as far as uh father above is concerned jehovah uh, the creator he is dealing with his people first he is disciplining his people first and that's why it's called the time of jacob's trouble mm -hmm. the time of mm -hmm. jacob's trouble that. is designed for his people that's when his people get it in the neck so to speak or that's when his people are corrected so to speak right so he's dealing with his people first and he's giving them uh, somewhat uh, uh, kind of treatment, you know, more considerate treatment. But nevertheless, it's still going to be uh, pretty awful to, to experience. But he also promises to preserve those who have chosen to follow him and who have chosen to obey him. And you, you, the way to love God is to obey Him. If you love Him, you are showing, uh, you, you are showing the love by through your obedience to Him, your obedience to His commandments. So, if you are willing to submit to uh, your Father above, to submit to God, and to accept His rule over your life then it means you are following his instructions you are following his laws and those people who have done that and who are following his instructions who are following his laws those people will escape not only the time of jacob's trouble they'll also they'll be kept safe during the time of jacob's trouble they will be making that exodus from jacob's trouble and they'll be protected right through jacob's trouble now, when we come to, uh, and then they'll have their reward. And then when we come to the Great Tribulation, that is for the rest of the world. They're not the children of Israel. That's the rest of the world. And they're the ones who've been doing all the nasty stuff to the sons of Jacob, right? So they're the one who get it in the neck then. And that is called, the great tribulation but the remnant of israel will escape take, yeah. It. yeah the remnant of israel will escape it i've yeah maybe uh uh you know i don't know if it's mainstream way of thinking but i've always seen the about i'm sorry the great tribulation and jacob's trouble as synonymous because no, then i think people have made that assumption but it's not not a correct assumption uh it it, it you know, it, it, it's, it, it, that's a general assumption, but it's not correct. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to show I want to show this on screen, Stephen. You're going to love this. Israel's land is from sea to shining sea. And what you just said about escaping, right? There's going to be a remnant, guys. Be a yeah. part of the remnant. Pray yeah. that you're counted worthy to escape. Pray that, you know, he, you find favor in his eyes. You're, you're walking this thing out in spirit and in truth. And it says that, once the spanking is over, once all the desolation happening of American cities, the millions of armies, you know, millions of men armies. But I will remove far from you the northern army and drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea, his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. It's from Joel 220. I love how you talked about this in your book, Stephen. Tell us about this. What's the significance of the Eastern and Western Sea? Well, you know, you know the American song, don't you? Um, um, I, 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 what is this American, beautiful American anthem about uh, 
America. You know, do you know that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, America, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Uh, let me see. Grace on thee. No, no, no. Maybe I'm singing the thinking the. They use the term one. from sea to shining sea in this song. It's America the, the beautiful. Yeah, America, America the, beautiful. the beautiful. That's the song. Now, I used to sing that song, and I would change one word, and the word I would change is America, and I would sing, "Oh Israel, Oh Israel." You know, however the song goes. Oh, I forget His how. grace on thee. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. See what I mean? So America is Israel. Take the word America out of the song and replace it with the word Israel and then sing it with all your heart. It's a beautiful <laughs> song. It's a beautiful song. And uh, and you see, uh, uh, America will never, never, will never be lost. They, they might make a huge mess of, of your country, but your country will never be lost. It will always be a country from sea to shining sea and it will always be Israel. It will come part of greater Israel. Yeah, and I've had it on screen here, uh, but you worded it so well in your book, I just had to throw it on screen here, that Israel, the actual Israel in the Middle East does not have an Eastern Sea and a Western Sea, right? No. Isn't it? Oh, man. See, my, my geography is not very good. I mean, you got the Mediterranean uh, that it borders, but, it, you know, I got the Gaza Strip. Um, but there's no Eastern Sea for sure. Okay, maybe you could argue there's the Mediterranean there, but it's talking about another land, guys. It's talking, <laughs> right, Stephen? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's and talking it's about quite, America. Quite yeah. something, isn't it? Talking about America, yeah. And then people say uh, America is not in Scripture. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. America is all over Scripture. And you need to know who America is. Uh, when you know who America is, then you'll find America on every other page in the Bible. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, isn't it? Well, because America is Israel. You see, that's what right. the Americans need to understand. And it's because you're Israel, you have a special destiny. And it's because you're Israel, you 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 uh, you have to you, you have to repent. You have to turn away from where you are at the moment because America is going in the wrong direction. It's going to hell in a breadbasket, mm -hmm. the way where she's going. So you need to turn around. Repent means turn around. Absolutely. You need to turn around and go the other way. Go the way towards salvation. Uh, you know, there is the future. The future is there. The future is not where you're going. Of course, mm -hmm. you're going somewhere else, another place, dark, nasty, horrible, stinking, the rotten place. That's where you're going. No future there at all. See, without our Father in heaven, none of us have a future. He is the future, and his kingdom is the future. That's where it's at, and that's where we need to be, and that's where we need to go. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and Yeshua, I have his words on screen, guys. Look, this is the hidden gospel message. It's hiding in plain sight. Matthew 15, 24. But Yeshua, he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's right. right. I was not sent except to the church of Gentiles, right? Is that what he said? <laughs> they're, all, they're, all, they're all American sheep, you see. Uh, I, I, he said, and I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of America. That's it. That's it. And then how, I want you to explain, because you have I forget which book of yours it is, but you explain John 10, 15, and 16 so well, Stephen, that he has sheep that are not of this fold, and he's going to bring those two, and they're going to be one flock with one shepherd. Yeah, you see, that when Yeshua talks about this fold, it's the fold that he was in. He was in Judah at the moment. And he was preaching his message in, in Jerusalem and in 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 in, in, uh, in Samaria uh, and in Judea, and and so that was the fold he was preaching to. But then he says, "I've I've got sheep who are not of this fold. And them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd." Yeah? So he wants to bring everyone together That's under, it. under under his under his rule 
uh, under his guidance, uh, under his direction. And he is going to rule. He is our future king. That's another thing you see. America is going to lose her Republican status in, in the new world because America is going to be part of a greater kingdom. And that kingdom is going to be called the, the United Kingdom of Israel, right? The United Kingdom of Israel. And the king will be Yeshua Hamashiach of Nazareth. It will be Jesus of Nazareth, who is going to be the king of kings and lord of lords. There'll be no one above him. There'll be no one above him. He is going to be the master of the universe and he'll rule the universe from this earth, from this earth, mm -hmm. from this earth. He will rule the entire matchless universe. And those who are his, those who are his will rule with him. That's it. So our destiny, our destiny is to rule the universe, the matchless ever expanding universe. Why that's wouldn't for, you want to be a part of that, right? <laughs> that's for us to rule. That's for us to rule. Because we are going to be one with him. We are going to be ahad with him. We're going to be united with him. He, we're going to be part of his family. In Hebrew, that's mishpocha. We're going to be part of the divine mishpocha. That's our future. And mm -hmm. that's the vision. There is no future in this present world. There is only a real future in the world to come. That's where you need to be. That's where you need to be at. That's right. That's where we all need to go. 100%, Stephen. And yeah, I mean, did we do a good job talking about George Washington? I mean, I feel like we addressed a lot of the conspiracy theory stuff because, yeah, you know, was Freemason, has Freemasonry be used, been used for evil? Of course it has. But you you read the account of how George Washington wasn't even the type of guy that would be seeking out signs and visions and prophecies. He was more of a simple man. He just went out in the woods and prayed. He was just more simple. He became, he took the, the position of a chaplain because no one was there, and he took the responsibility himself. He just he seems like a pretty straight shooter guy to me. He received a word. Th the first two parts of it came true so now we're just waiting for that third part but i don't know about you guys but i see the writing on the wall and thank you Stephen, for just being here to help us kind of make more sense of this and thank you for your work for put for being diligent writing a book is never easy you did it in six weeks and then you know your heart sadly gave, gave you problems good and so this, this is a, a a message that's being delivered to us now by a wounded, well, at the time you were definitely wounded, a uh, wounded warrior message being sent here, wounded on the battlefield trying to deliver this message. Guys, don't take it lightly and don't, don't take it for granted either. Uh, check out, test it, look at what he has to say. You're going to be blessed by it. So could, could I just ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, of, uh, if anyone, anyone uh, uh, getting this book from Amazon, George Washington's Prophetic Vision, its relevance to 2020s America. May I ask you a favor? When you read this book, and, and, and assuming you are reasonably impressed with it and convicted by it, then may I ask you to write a review to Amazon about this book? Because the more reviews a book gets, the more it gets read. Mm -hmm. And we really need to publicize this work because I feel very strongly that uh, America is now out of time uh, and that America, and that is including you and everybody else who lives in America, needs to now prepare for final impact mm -hmm. of the invasion that is coming to America, right? And so America is out of time. And we need to get this message to as many people as we possibly can to give them the chance to hear this message and to take action, the necessary action to save their lives, not only just to save their lives, but to save their future for their children and all their dependents. 
So this is an urgent message, an urgent message. Thank you for that, Brother Stephen. <clears throat> is yeah, I, I was impacted by this one, guys. It made me it, it teared me up a few times because the truth the truth has been hidden from us. It really has. It's hard to find. So when when you find it, it's like a cool drink of water in a hot desert. And um, so <laughs> trust me, you, you want to investigate these things and, and then sh spread the word. OK. And uh, Brother Stephen, is there anything else you would like to share with us uh, before we close out today? <laughs> no, just thank you very much for allowing me to to say my bit. And uh, thank you also for promoting this book. I'm, I'm very much indebted to you, Abraham. And indeed, I'm indebted to all your all the ones who listen to this to this uh, program. So bless you all. And um, yes, and God, God keep you and God save you and God bless you. 100 percent yeah shalom guys may yeshua continue that work that he started with you may yeshua continue that work and see it to fullness and completion in your life and uh, i just pray that yeshua bless each and every single one of us as we go our separate ways and let the word of god impact us yeshua let the word of god remove that heart of stone give us a heart of flesh that listens and that hears your words and that actually takes action on your words and applies the things that you're saying, Father, that we may obtain a heart of wisdom. Give us a heart of wisdom, Father. We pray, we ask, we intercede for everybody here in the chat. We intercede for those listening to the replay. <sighs> Give us wisdom, Father, that we may navigate these dark days with faith, having victory over the enemy. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Thank you guys again. Thank you, Stephen. We'll catch you soon. We'll hopefully have you back on, Lord willing. Uh, talk more about Hebrew ancestry and all these beautiful things that you bring to the table. I can't thank you enough for your diligence and for your faithfulness over the years to your calling. Bless you and thank you. Thank you, brother. We'll see you yeah. soon. Yep. Bye. Ciao, guys. We'll see you. Take